Hi, everyone. Welcome to Engineering Spotlight, our virtual learning series. I'm Rebecca Wingate, president of the Chicago Engineers Foundation. We are pleased to present these spotlight events throughout the year, and we discuss trending topics with industry experts, and we're excited to bring you today's presentation on Chicago's water system. Today's event would not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors, including our presenting sponsor, Christopher B. Burke Engineering, our virtual sponsor, Stephen Schlegel, and our community sponsors, Sharon Harmsworth, Diane Ferrari, and Salas O'Brien. Thank you very much. Also, a special thanks to the Illinois section of the American Society of Civil Engineers for providing PDH certificates for today's event. You can register for a PDH certificate now via the link in the chat. Proceeds from today's discussion benefit Chicago Engineers Foundation student programs and scholarships. The mission of the Chicago Engineers Foundation is to encourage and empower the next generation of engineers. Our organization proudly supports students across the city with virtual K-12 learning opportunities, up to 100 scholarship awards presented annually, and career resources to help Chicago students achieve their engineering career goals. More information about CEF and how to get involved is available at our website, chicagoengineersfoundation.org. Today's spotlight is on Chicago's water system. Our featured speaker is an expert on our water resources, and we are excited to welcome him today. Richard Dick Lanyon has a lifelong association with the waterways in and around Chicago. He retired as executive director of the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago in 2010, after a 50 year career in urban water issues. In addition to his MWRD career, Dick is the author of Building the Canal to Save Chicago, Draining Chicago of the Early Years in the North Area, West by Southwest to Stickney, Draining the Central Area of Chicago and Exercising Clout, Exorcising Clout, and, <laughs> and, Cal and Calumet, First and Forever, Draining the South Area of Chicago and Territorial Expansion. All four books completely describe the engineer drainage, engineer drainage system in metropolitan Chicago and the history of the MWRD infrastructure. You can visit everythinggoesmedia.com for more information on Mr. Lanyon's books. Dick has received numerous awards during his career, including the American Society of Civil Engineers National Government Civil Engineer of the Year Award, the Distinguished Alumnus of the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the Uni University of Illinois, the Edward J. Cleary Award from the American Academy of Environmental Engineers and Scientists, and the Distinguished Service Award from the National Association of Clean Water Agencies. Dick Lanyon is a past president of the Illinois section of AFCE and holds bachelor's and master's degrees in civil engineering from the University of, of Illinois. In 2013, Dick was inducted into the NACWA Hall of Fame. In addition, Dick served on the Evanston Public Library Board of Directors, was alderman of the Evanston 8th Ward, and recently completed an eight-year term as chairman of the Evanston Utilities Commission. He and his wife, Marsha, reside in Evanston, and he continues to be an advocate for sensible and sustainable water management in the urban environment. Today's session is being recorded, recorded and will be available to view along with Mr. Lanyon's slide deck. As you have questions or comments during today's presentation, please enter them in the chat feature. Following Dick's presentation, we will host a question and answer session. Please welcome Mr. Dick Lanyon. Thank you, Becky. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me to uh, be with you and to make this presentation. I hope you find it uh, informative and um, We'll start right off. I want to first uh, uh, give you uh, some uh, information about, uh, well, let's see. There we go. Um, four engineers who were um, key people in the early years in Chicago's water resource development. First, uh, Ella Sylvester Chesbro self-taught engineer, um, was brought to the city uh, from Boston, uh, and he served as uh, various capacities for the city up until his retirement um, in uh, 1879. Uh, he was in, in 
His first assignment was to lay out a sewer system, which you see here in the map on the right. Uh, in 15 years, the uh, 30 square mile uh, area of the city was completely sewered. And then after that, he was the uh, uh, innovator of the underwater, uh, under Lake Michigan water tunnel and the water crib two miles offshore to bring uh, clean water into the city. That went into uh, operation in 1867. Uh, whoops, next we have uh, Lyman Cooley and uh, who was a chief engineer for six months of the sanitary district of Chicago. He and the board didn't get along. That happens occasionally. But uh, he came back and was an elected uh, trustee of the district for two years um, uh, shortly after that. In this caricature on the right, uh, it shows his role as an advocate for the building of the canal to reverse the flow of the river. He was also on the staff at uh, Northwestern University as a faculty member in engineering and for a had a formal education in engineering. Third is uh, Isham Randolph, another self-taught engineer. Uh, he was the chief engineer of the district for 13 years and was the person that pulled off the building of the sanitary and ship canal. Uh, he uh, managed the construction work for the eight years that it was in operation and also um, did the design work for the other channel work that followed uh, after his leaving the district. Last but not least is uh, George Wisner, the chief engineer for another 13 years. Uh, George was uh, educated at MIT and Harvard and um, brought to the district his, uh, his uh, science-based education and uh, innovated the first treatment systems built by the district. Well, this is the um, map of the uh, Chicago area that uh, the first uh, explorers would have found. Uh, we had the uh, Chicago River and its branches draining into Lake Michigan. And out south, we had uh, the Catamount River and its tributaries doing the same. 10 miles west of the shoreline was the subcontinental divide. Uh, and to the west of that was the Des Plaines River system. So the waters to the west of that divide drained to the Atlantic Ocean via the Illinois and Mississippi River and uh, to the east of that line to the Atlantic Ocean via the Great Lakes. Uh, Chicago Portage was uh, the, <clears throat> the famed connection between the two watersheds uh, used by the Native Americans and the early French explorers. And uh, the thing about the early topography is that the river, the Des Plaines River in what is now the Western suburbs is higher than the water level in Lake Michigan. And at times on an annual basis, excess flow from the Des Plaines River would flow back through the Mud Lake area and the West Fork and reach the Lake Michigan. However, the landform declines and when you get down to Joliet, uh, the water level in the, the river is 40 feet below Lake Michigan. So um, the early engineers saw how gravity could uh, help uh, improve the drainage of the Chicago area, which because of its early geologic formation was very poorly drained, very young, a lot of marshes and wetlands. Uh, one of the problems that was faced by the city and was its rapid growth. Um, I don't know if I can eliminate this box at the bottom here, covering up the day, the years. But anyway, the rapid growth uh, after 1880, um, part of that was due to uh, annexation uh, by the city of its surrounding communities in 1889. Uh, of course, this rapid growth put a lot of stress on the infrastructure too keep up with the demands of the population. And the first drainage improvement was started in 1855 with the raging of, raising of the city streets. Of course, this is not an 1855 photograph, but it uh, very uh, dramatically illustrates what was accomplished with that, with the early land um, forms not very much 
higher than the river level and the Lake Michigan level, uh, leading to its poor drainage. With the higher uh, street levels, uh, drainage could be improved and sewers could be built. And that's what was done. Uh, some of the earliest drainage improvements uh, were for navigation in 1848, the Illinois and Michigan Canal opened and it connected to the south branch of the Chicago River by near Ashland Avenue. And it went west through the um, city area and then followed the Des Plaines River on the eastern side of the valley wall um, down to Joliet where it crossed and continued on to LaSalle, Illinois on the north side of the Des Plaines and Illinois rivers. Uh, also in 1870, uh, Mr. Ogden and Wentworth, who were some of the earlier mayors and also land speculators, uh, improved this connection, uh, which was the Chicago Portage, to drain the Mud Lake area so that they could market their properties out there. Uh, and that was prior to 1892. 1892 was the beginning of the great canal building project. Uh, just to summarize the early drainage events after the incorporation of the city, uh, the INM Canal, the first big flood from the Des Plaines River that affected the city was in 1849. And then going on, the raising of the city, the sewer system. Stockyards consolidation was important because there was a lot of dispersed pollution from all of the small slaughtering operations in the Chicago area. And by uh, moving the stockyard south of 39th Street, that eliminated a lot of the uh, local pollution. The Ogden went with ditch, of course, the fire and several years of recovery after that. 1885 was the second large displaced River flood through Chicago. And that brought back to the forefront the drainage problems and the pollution of the Chicago River and Lake Michigan, which resulted in the city developing a plan to reverse the flow of the Chicago River. However, the city couldn't implement this plan uh, because the canal had to go far beyond the city limits and also required a lot of funding, which the city didn't have. So in 1889, the Sanitary District of Chicago was created by the Illinois General Assembly and it was approved by referendum by the citizenry in Chicago and it created an organization that could build the canal and also had its own source of funds, a new source of taxation. And the construction of this canal was a 38 mile long project from Lake Street on the South Branch all the way down to McDonald Street in Joliet. Five miles in through Joliet were an improvement of the Des Plaines River. The first five miles through the Des yeah, were an improvement of the South Branch because both of these waterways had to accommodate additional flow by the building of the Sanitary and Ship Canal, which began at Damon Avenue and ran down to Lockport Road. 15 miles of this new canal went, had to be uh, mined out of rock, solid limestone, and from Willow Springs Road up to Damon Avenue, another 13 miles that was through earth. A little bit of rock was found in this area near Willow Springs, but uh, not very much. The steam shovel, steam power, and rails were the critical elements for construction back in the 1890s. Any, anything that had to move had to be moved on steel rails and uh, including these dump cars, a small locomotive to move the spoil to a spoil area, and uh, even the steam shovels were on rails. So this uh, was a railroad management project to keep moving the rails around to keep ahead of the uh, construction so you had the opportunity to move machinery where it was needed. And the rock had to be blasted out with uh, explosives. First the um, mechanically cutting a slot in the rock uh, to define the walls of the channel. These were walls vertically um, 160 feet apart, and then um, drilling and uh, explosives were used to uh, take off the rock in layers. And here you see this beautiful photograph from the archives of the Water Reclamation District catching the flying debris from an explosion. 
a lot of the photographs I'm using are from the archives of the Water Reclamation District. And then uh, getting the rock out of the uh, uh, cut was a manual labor job uh, and using those mechanical overhead devices. In this last photograph, I showed a cantilevered uh, truss arrangement. Uh, other devices used were cableways and also just uh, building ramps with uh, man animal power to move uh, material up to the spoil area. Uh, one contractor completed his work in three years when four years were allowed. So here you have the celebration of this completion, the 35 foot deep cut into the limestone and this huge pile of spoil didn't have the funds to haul it anywhere. Where would they haul it to? And so they just bought enough land to pile the spoil next to the canal. Here they're installing a granite marker on the Will Cook County line uh, near Lamont. Now this spoil eventually has been um, removed for construction projects. So these spoil piles are long gone. Uh, in the uh, Work was completed late in 1899 and the canal system went into operation on January 17th, 19, uh, 1900. And here's a photograph of the lowering of the submersible weir at Lockport to allow the water to flow from the sanitary and ship canal over to the Des Plaines River. Behind the submersible weir were a series of sluice gates for flood flows, but the submersible weir was used for low flow control because this control point was 35 miles from Lake Michigan. And the engineers at the time had to deal with a variable water level in the lake. And the control point being 35 miles away was a very challenging exercise. The next big project uh, to remove pollution from the lake after removing, uh, reversing the flow of the Chicago River was to deal with all the sewers that had been built uh, that discharged directly to the lake. Here is a uh, map of the north side, uh, Lakeview, Edgewater, Rogers Park, etc. They had all been communities at one time and had built their own sewer systems. The city and the sanitary district cooperated in the construction of an intercepting sewer along the lakefront. Two sewers were built, they met at Lawrence Avenue and uh, a pumping station at the corner of Broadway and Lawrence. Uh, which you see here on the right was built and that pumped the flow through a conduit over to the North Branch, thus see, removing all of that pollution from Lake Michigan. A similar project was uh, implemented on the south side with a pumping station at 39th Street. And in the Calumet area, no sewers discharged directly to the lake, but they did discharge to the Calumet River, which flowed into the lake. In addition to that, the city built a large pumping station at 95th Street, which collected sewage from this developing area in uh, the south the east side and pumped it directly into the Calumet River. No sewage was discharged to Lake Calumet, but pumping stations west of the lake uh, discharged sewage to the uh, Little Calumet River uh, at uh, the foot of Indiana Street. Uh, stormwater was allowed to flow into Lake Calumet. Now this 1808, uh, 1908 map, sorry, um, shows a proposed Calumet channel coming over to the uh, mouth of Lake Calumet where it was connected to the Calumet River. That was the original plan, but the federal government would not allow uh, what the district wanted to build. They wanted to build a large channel and to divert additional water out of Lake Michigan and the federal government would not allow that. So the uh, canal that was built was um, terminated over here by Blue Island. And that is shown in this uh, map of the Calumet Seg Channel, which connected the Little Calumet River and over to Blue Island, uh, to the Sanitary and Ship Canal near Lamont, I'm sorry. Um, now the, Sanitary District replaced that pumping station uh, at 95th Street with a new station. They built intercepting sewers along the Calumet River 
they collected all the sewage and pumped it over to the uh, Western Lake Calumet where another pumping station was built and a treatment plant uh, and treated flow was discharged to the west, the east end of the uh, Calumet Sag Channel. So uh, after that was completed in 1922, no wastewater effluent uh, treated or otherwise was discharged to the Calumet River. Uh, now that was the beginning, uh, early elements of a canal building uh, projects and, and uh, summarized here, starting with the 1848 completion of the Illinois Michigan Canal. Sanitary and Ship Canal was completed in 1900. It was extended seven years later to build a powerhouse for hydroelectric energy and a navigation lock. And that lock eliminated the need for the i &M Canal between Chicago and Joliet. The North Branch of the Chicago River was improved uh, to allow the building of the uh, North Shore Channel up to Wilmette. Um, it took uh, almost two decades to complete the widening and deepening of the South Branch because of the land acquisition problems uh, that were encountered uh, along that five miles of channel improvement. Calumet Sag Channel was built over an 11 year period. Part of that delay was caused by the, the First World War. And then um, uh, in the 20s and early 30s, the Little Calumet River was improved for uh, adequate flow capacity. Uh, now, although the government, the federal government wouldn't allow the Calumet Sag Channel to be built larger in the 19, around 1910, uh, after World War II, they changed their mind uh, due to the interest in better navigation of the uh, developing Calumet area in Northwest Indiana and uh, Southeast Chicago. And the Calumet Sang Channel was widened uh, by a factor of four times to allow um, two way navigable traffic. And uh, as a result of all that, this is the waterway system we have today, uh, a 77 mile network of canals with three inlets on the lakefront, one at Wilmette on the North Shore Channel, one downtown at the Chicago River Lock on the main stem of the Chicago River, and the third, a lock on the Calumet River south of 130th Street. Uh, and uh, all of this feeds into one outlet at Lockport on the uh, Sanitary and Ship Canal just north of Joliet. And 70% um, of the flow in this system uh, comes from three huge water reclamation plants, the uh, O'Brien plant in Skokie on the North Shore Channel, the Stickney plant uh, in the village of Stickney on the Sanitary and Ship Canal, and the Calumet water reclamation plant in southeast of Chicago, discharging to the Little Calumet River. Uh, so this water comes from Lake Michigan and we have the uh, opportunity to use it before it becomes sewage and then uh, sewage, treated sewage effluent and discharged to the waterway system. The other 30% of the flow comes from uh, two tributaries, the North Branch, about a hundred square mile drainage area and the Little Calumet River, uh, about a 200 square mile drainage area in South Cook County and Will County, Illinois, and also part of Lake County, Indiana. Uh, and also there's storm flow in, from the, the other part of that 30% and a little bit of direct diversion from the lake at these three uh, intake control points. We'll talk more about lake diversion a little bit later. But also this waterway system is now part of the Illinois waterway system. It's called the Lockport Pool. It is the upper pool in a series of locks and dams between Chicago and Alton, Illinois that uh, provide for navigation on the Illinois waterway. Now the uh, early treatment plant uh, construction began uh, before 1920s. And today we have a uh, fully uh, implemented wastewater collection and treatment system. The Water Reclamation District is not 
own or operate local sewers in municipalities. That is a municipal function, but it does have a network of intercepting sewers shown by the black lines on this map that collects sewage from 124 municipalities in uh, Cook County and bring them to one of the seven water reclamation plants. I mentioned the three large plants already. There's also another small plant on Lamont discharging to the sanitary, sanitary and ship canal. And then three smaller plants. Well, they're not that small. They're pretty big by comparison to other areas in the country, but they're small by comparison to the three big plants <clears throat> that serve the Northwest part of Cook County. In addition, there is an area tributary uh, to Poplar Creek that is treated at a Elgin uh, plant um, in Elgin, Illinois, uh, through intergovernmental cooperation. All told, these plants discharge well over a billion gallons uh, each day of treated sewage effluent. And the range and flow of capacity at these plants is a significant from, from four milligrams per a million, million gallons per day, I'm sorry, <laughs> at the small Lamont plant to 1,500 million gallons per day at the Stickney plant. Now, much of the suburban construction of since World War II uses separate sewers where you have separate collection systems for sewage and stormwater. But Chicago and 51 municipalities surrounding the city uh, that were developed earlier uh, have combined sewers. And combined sewers are a problem because of the pollution that's discharged during storm times. And for that, the plan, the tunnel and reservoir plan was developed in the 1960s, approved locally in 1972, and it was approved 1974 by the federal government and used um, construction grant money under the Clean Water Act for much of the construction. We have four different tunnel systems. You have about six miles of tunnels in uh, the northwest suburbs, uh, north and west of O'Hare Airport. Uh, and that flow is collected. It is held in a smaller reservoir, the Majewski Reservoir. It is treated in the Curie plant which discharges to Willow Creek and eventually that flows into the Des Plaines River. Out south, we have the Calumet Tunnel System, about 30 miles of tunnels that uh, serve the south, south side and of the city and the south suburbs. Uh, the flows are stored in the Thornton Reservoir, uh, which was a former lobe of the uh, Thornton Quarry and um, the flow is treated at the Calumet plant and discharged to the Little Calumet River. The two largest tunnel systems are the Des Plaines tunnels, which falls, flows through the western suburbs and ends, ends at the McCook Reservoir. Uh, the other and largest tunnel system is the mainstream system, which serves the north suburbs and most of the city of Chicago um, with the branch going up the Northwest uh, suburbs like Morton Grove, Skokie, it's Niles, et cetera. And then uh, ending in the, also in the McCook Reservoir. Uh, flows captured in the McCook Reservoir are pumped at the mainstream pumping station back to the Stickney plant for complete treatment before discharge to the sanitary and ship canal. This uh, huge project uh, construction began in 1975 all tunnel work was completed by the year 2006. Uh, and uh, the reservoir construction has been underway uh, since 19, uh, since, yes, uh, 1990, with the first reservoir uh, construction up here at Majewski. And then um, the other two reservoirs are the Thornton Reservoir is completed, and the McCook Reservoir is still under construction, but one third of its capacity is available and in operation. To get the water, uh, the combined sewer overflow from the surface sewer system down to the deep tunnel, uh, they have a connecting structure and a uh, 
slide the sluice gate to control flow into the tunnel system. In the local sewer, there is a tide gate because uh, when, during storm times, the water level will rise up. And if the tide gate were not there, you would have the opportunity for river water to flow back yes, into the tunnel. <clears throat> Uh, and the sluice gate to control inflow simply controls the um, unusual hydrodynamics of flow in a confined tunnel system. So the drop shafts, there are about 400 drop shafts throughout the metropolitan area, and they, most of them have a dividing wall in them so that the flow goes down one side of the shaft and the air can be released to the other side of the shaft. The wall has events in it for to allow aspiration of the flowing water that helps dissipate the energy because these drop shafts are up to 300 feet deep and uh, considerable energy has to be dissipated before the water flows into the, the tunnel. And from the inside of the tunnel, you have this view, uh, tunnel diameters vary from 12 feet up to 33 feet and this particular location shows the inflow from a, the boot of a drop shaft. We're looking now southwest across the McCook Reservoir, the largest of the uh, three uh, combined sewer overflow reservoirs. And we are looking from a point uh, southwest of Summit, Illinois. <clears throat> uh, the very busy corridor here, uh, we have uh, the Illinois and Michigan Canal, uh, over in the woods, we have the Sanitary and Ship Canal. Uh, we have the Interstate 55. We have the Des Plaines River. In addition to that, we have two rail lines. Uh, Santa Fe is over on this side, and a metro line is over on this side. Uh, and we're looking at phase uh, stage one of the McCook uh, Reservoir. Uh, stage two is still under construction in the distance. This reservoir is a mile and a quarter long and it varies in width up to 500 feet. Uh, these the pylons, uh, there are some water standing in the bottom of the reservoir. These pylons support aerators, which are used to maintain an adequate amount of uh, dissolved oxygen in the surface water of the reservoir. Looking from the side uh, over the reservoir, here is the reservoir uh, and the Des Plaines River. This is the complex called the Mainstream Pumping Station, uh, which returns the flow back to the Stickney plant for treatment. You have actually two uh, pump rooms underground, 350 feet underground. Um, and these circular buildings are access shafts for the ends of each of the pump. And this is the control building for the complex here. We have two surge, surge towers. Um, and this structure is a, the surface structure for a gate and screen chamber fire underground to control the inflow. And then this smaller structure here controls the outflow from the pumping stations. And of course it is connected to the reservoirs through these controlled connections. All of that flow goes back to the Stickney plant for treatment. We're looking here from the west. Here's downtown Chicago, Sanitary and Ship Canal, and uh, the Stevenson Expressway. And this is 39th Street. Uh, the plant starts at Laramie and runs to Ridgeland Avenue, almost a square mile in area. And the large tankage you see in this area are four batteries for aeration tanks and final clarifiers on each side. Um, uh, the pumping station, uh, the Southwest pumping station is located here with uh, grit tanks and preliminary settling tanks. There's another pump station at West Side plant back in the, dim, in the distance and along 39th street are sludge digestion facilities. Central Avenue goes over the property on a viaduct, and in that area are a lot of facilities for processing the sludge resulting from the sewage treatment process. Now, all of this wastewater and stormwater infrastructure 
is for the purpose of protecting this vital resource for Northeast Illinois, Lake Michigan. Uh, the red on this map shows the watershed of the lake, which is uh, not, it's a little bit bigger than the lake itself, but of course, Lake Michigan is the largest of the five great lakes that is totally within the continental United States. And the um, arrow at the top is the, uh, shows the outflow from Lake Michigan through the Straits of Mackinac, the only natural outlet for Lake Michigan. However, we have created another outlet down here in Chicago. And as you can see, most of the people live around the lake, the southern part of the lake. And um, that is where most of the pollution would be put into the lake were that the case. Um, so all of that would have to travel through the natural outlet. You can imagine how serious a problem Lake Michigan would become if it were contaminated. There would be no way to flush it out like Lake Erie, which uh, is much smaller and has flow from west to east. So we do divert water here at Lake Michigan. It's uh, under uh, the uh, Supreme Court decree. We'll talk about that in a minute, but what is the water diverted for? There are three purposes, direct diversion for navigation and canal system operations, uh, domestic water supply for municipalities and stormwater runoff from the diverted area that formerly was discharging to Lake Michigan. And one thing is wastewater from Illinois is not returned to the lake, helping to preserve the water quality of Lake Michigan. Because even treated wastewater under Clean Water Act standards isn't the purest and uh, over time contaminants could accumulate. Uh, the uh, US Supreme Court uh, decree of 1930 is what set up the uh, diversion of this water uh, it has been modified since then, but uh, it basically is the same. It allows Illinois to divert 3,200 cubic feet per second from Lake Michigan, and that's on a based on a 40-year running average. And the flow is justified for navigation. And um, we have the opportunity to use this flow for municipal water supply before it is needed for navigation on the Illinois waterway. Uh, there are many players in the lake diversion game, and uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is responsible to, to uh, account for the lake diversion and to report to the court on the compliance with the decree requirements. The Illinois De Department of Natural Resources, Office of Water Resources, uh, allocates the water under state law to the various water users, and uh, they must report uh, the usage of water to the Corps of Engineers. The U.S. Geological Survey measures and reports flow from the canal system to the Des Plaines River uh, and also uh, in watersheds within the diverted area. The Water Reclamation District uses the water uh, for canal operations and must report that usage to the uh, state uh, and Corps of Engineers. Domestic water supply uh, is, the, uh, is a large user of this waterway. This map was found in the Chicago Tribune about four years ago. It's a beautiful depiction of how this resource is used. There are 16 uh, points along the lakefront where water is withdrawn from the lake for municipal uses. Uh, the largest being the uh, city of Chicago uh, Jardine plant, the second largest being the city of Chicago Sawyer plant uh, down at 75th Street, and the third being the Evanston uh, water treatment plant um, in Evanston, and uh, others are along the lakeshore. And you also see by these various spider web type uh, diagrams how many communities are supplied with uh, Lake Michigan water from these. Uh, primary uh, diverters of water from the Lake Michigan. Uh, all of these uh, water supplies have to receive an allocation from the state. There are over 216 municipal and utility users of Lake Michigan water. Uh, they must meter their use. They must report annually to the state. They must have a water conservation plan. 
They must inspect and correct for leakage, and they must have a public education program, a very uh, uh, active endeavor. Um, Stormwater from the diverted area. This is the diverted area shown by the dashed line here. 673 square miles, which formerly drained into Lake Michigan, which now drains uh, to the Des Plaines and the Illinois rivers. Um, the water runoff from that area is counted as lake diversion, and that has to be uh, measured. USGS measures rainfall and water and stream flow in the watershed and the Corps of Engineers calculates the runoff and part of their accounting procedures. Uh, direct diversion from the lake is used by both the Water Reclamation District um, to maintain the navigable water levels in the canal system and also to uh, uh, water is used during the summertime in the warm weather to uh, maintain water quality standards in uh, the canal system. However, the Water Reclamation District allocation for that purpose is scheduled to be reduced in 2031 when the McCook Reservoir is completed. Uh, and by that time, there should be even less pollution from combined sewer overflow. And so the water will be not used for dilution. Uh, the the uh, Corps of Engineers uses a small amount of water for operation of the O'Brien Lock and Dam on the Calumet River and on the Chicago River Lock near downtown Chicago. And the Corps of Engineers, as I said, is a, uh, responsible for reporting to the Corps court. And uh, their latest completed report is for water year 2017 which ended on September 30th of that year. Uh, in that year, 2,677 CFS had been diverted. And uh, the breakdown in usage is shown there. Most of it is for a storm water runoff from the diverted area, but almost about the same amount for water supply and uh, a much lesser amount for direct diversion. The 40-year average uh, as of the end of 2017 is 3,041. So there's a comfortable margin below the 3,200 limit, uh, showing that there's water available for additional uh, allocation. And uh, currently the city of Joliet has an application pending for diversion because their reliance on groundwater is proving to be uh, a, a problem uh, not only the groundwater levels are de declined so far that it's hard to pump the amount of water they need, but also there's quality problems with the groundwater. Uh, a brief summary of the lake diversion litigation uh, started out uh, with Missouri trying to stop the construction of the, the, uh, the operation of the Sanitary and Ship Canal, and that did not succeed. This schematic is was used by uh, the Sanitary District to defend its uh, diversion of waterway. What it did show was the contamination starting at Chicago dissipated by the time you got to Peoria, and then the distilleries in the Peoria area added more pollution, which dissipated by the time it got down to the mouth of the Illinois River. However, this data was based on bacteria, which we know dies off naturally in waterways. However, had they used the solids in sewage as a measure, it would have been a different story. But uh, anyway, that wasn't done and the court found in favor of Chicago. Uh, federal litigation against the district started with the controversy over the Calumet Seg Channel uh, and then the lake states got into the picture. Wisconsin was first, and then Michigan, Minnesota, uh, Ohio, New York, Pennsylvania followed. Um, the Supreme Court decree was handed down in 1930. Uh, and then that has been modified twice for procedural reasons, um, such as the 40-year average. At first, it was a five-year average, was, which was proved difficult for financing of municipal water uh, infrastructure. 
Uh, there were some problems in the 90s, which uh, resulted in negotiations of a memo of understanding. And uh, there had been no uh, litigation since uh, that time. However, when the Asian carp issue came to the forefront, the state of Michigan tried to use uh, the diversion issue to reopen the Supreme Court case. And they were um, informed by the uh, Supreme Court that the Asian carp don't count in the lake diversion uh, issue. That completes my uh, presentation. I want to thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to answer any questions and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Shall I stop sharing? Please feel free. Um, if anyone has any questions, you're welcome to either use the chat or feel free to unmute yourself. Um, I will start with a question, Dick. Um, you t talked about the uh, latest completed report from the Army Corps of Engineers in 2017. Is it typical to be a few years behind where we are right now with the reports or is that a different kind of thing? Well, um, with all due respect to the Corps of Engineers, I think um, we know that um, as an agency, they tend to be a little tardy on some of their work. Um, but yes, it, it, it is a very complicated process to put this together. And, and uh, typically, the reports are two to three years behind the time. Dick, we have another question. Can you explain whether the 1893 World's Fair highlighted any of the engineering achievements you just showed us and how much uh, of the reversal was completed before the World's Fair? Uh, well, there was no reversal before the World's Fair, uh, but the World's Fair brought a lot of people to Chicago. And of course, the uh, idea of this, uh, the building a canal to reverse the flow of a river was uh, a world famous project. And so the railroads um, took train loads of people out to Lamont and allowed them to view the construction work. And there are many photographs of uh, crowds of people doing that. But uh, no, the diversion, uh, reversal of the flow of the river didn't occur until 1900. Uh, I, I have a, a couple of questions. Um, I've just been exploring the I and M canal and the, and the Santiago Ship Canal uh, on a couple of weekends uh, this month. And one of the things that surprised me is the aqueducts. And apparently the canal actually crosses rivers I'm wondering if you can explain uh, how that works and how that's done. Well, um, it's no different than a, um, a highway bridge crossing um, uh, an interstate route or something. Uh, this is where you had a difference in gradient between the local uh, stream that was crossing the route of the canal and the canal itself. Um, so uh, generally, um, the aqueducts were built above the gradients of the local streams. So the canal was put in a bridge, on a bridge, so to speak, with side walls that contained the water. Um, and the stream was allowed to flow underneath the bridge. Uh, does that still exist in the Sanitary Ship Canal? Pardon? Yeah, so I was talking about the I and M, the old I and M canal. I'm yes. Are there, still, are, are there still aqueducts in the Sanitary Ship Canal? No, oh, no, no, no. Okay. No, there's no. That, that was that was excavated down into the ground or into the rock, so mm -hmm. it doesn't go over. Um, it doesn't go over any uh, roads. Okay. Uh, okay. However, when you get down to Lockport, it, it is above the local land. So um, you go up and over the canal on higher bridges uh, if you're down in the Lockport area. Uh, my second question uh, has to do with the Panama Canal. You were talking about earth moving and using railroads to move earth in the digging of the canal in the Chicago area. And from what I've read, some of uh, of the Panama Canal was actually planned um, at the Union League Club uh, in Chicago. 
And the and from what I've read from McCullough's book, it sounds like the railroad expertise that came from the United States, and and I gather the canal digging expertise. Uh, helped the U.S. to succeed in building the Panama Canal, whereas the French had failed. And I'm wondering if you could comment on how much the Chicago area canals informed the building of the Panama Canal. Well, sure. Um, a great deal, a great deal. First of all, there is a couple of fables here. Um, the amount of excavation for the Sanitary and Ship Canal didn't came nowhere near the amount of excavation for the Panama Canal. Uh, and the other uh, fable I've heard is that the equipment that was used to build the Sanitary and Ship Canal was shipped down to Panama. That's not true either because there was a new generation of, of much larger machinery that was used on the Panama Canal. Um, but your point about the railroad expertise is well taken. Uh, in fact, Isham Randolph, uh, one of the gentlemen I showed early on, um, was appointed by um, uh, Teddy Roosevelt to be on the Panama Canal Commission. And uh, this was before the decision was made uh, whether to have a sea level canal or a lock uh, structure canal uh, across the isthmus of Panama. And Isham um, and other engineers on the, on the panel strongly advocated for a high level canal with locks uh, and the construction of Lake Gaton uh, for water supply for the locks. And of course they prevailed over those who wanted a sea level canal. So I think uh, the, uh, the impact of uh, railroad engineering from the states and uh, uh, the expertise on canal building was uh, significant for the Panam Panama Canal. Thank you. Dick, we have a few questions in the chat. Um, the first is regarding the high rises that continue to be built in the city. Um, and how does that building that keeps happening of those high rises, how does that impact or maybe not impact the water and sewer systems? Um, and if it does impact, how could that maybe be changed in your opinion? Uh, let's see, I'm not sure I understand the question. The Maybe could you rephrase it or? Yeah, um, the person was asking whether the high rises that are being continue to be built in the city, whether they're having an impact on the water and sewer systems that were built long before it uh, in Chicago. Okay, uh, da, 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 da. I'm looking for that question in the chat box. Um, well, the high rises, um, they don't, I don't see that they have any impact on, on the water, water use. Um, there's, there's sufficient water. Um, and, uh, you know, if, or if anything, um, putting, stacking people up in high rises helps with stormwater management. You can get more people, uh, in a smaller area and, uh, that might contribute less runoff per person than if you had everybody sprawled out in single family homes. And I hate to say this, but sometimes I say that the single family home is one of our biggest stormwater management problems. And uh, someone else would like to know if the 1922 litigation that you spoke about, is that still pending? Uh, they didn't see a completion date on that one. I'm sorry, part. Uh, the 1922 litigation that was part of your presentation, is that still pending? 1922? Uh, it's still a, an active case before the court. It, uh, there hasn't been any uh, litigation uh, on it except for the brief um, uh, issue brought up by the state of Michigan on the Asian carp. Um, the last uh, significant uh, court action was in 1980 when the uh, decree was modified for procedural purposes. But it is still an active uh, uh, case before the court. 
And uh, one more question in the chat, and then we can go to the rest of our guests too, who might have questions. Um, there's been a lot of work done to reduce the pollution in the Chicago River. Um, how far has this work come and how much further do you think is left to go? Uh, on the uh, reservoir construction? The pollution in the river, the Chicago River. Well, um, the frequency of combined sewer overflows has been significantly reduced um, but they still occur on occasion, um, and uh, more pr more prevalently of late, they occur in the southwest area uh, on the Des Plaines River, um, some of the uh, western suburbs along the lower parts of the Des Plaines River, um, yeah, Riverside, uh, um, Brookfield, etc. And that is because there, some of the construction that's still underway at McCook impacts that area. Um, but uh, for other parts of the system, uh, the reservoirs are capturing most of the uh, events and uh, eliminating the combined sewer overflows. And we just added another question. Um... Isn't there an issue with the Trump Tower using river water for cooling the building in excess of what it was allowed? Do other buildings use river water for cooling that you know of? Yes, several buildings do use the river water for cooling. Um, they are uh, each under a permit and there are thermal limits uh, that are applied. Uh, I believe the, uh, the issue on the Trump Tower was one where there had not been compliance with the thermal limits, uh, but uh, many buildings still use the river water for cooling. All right, if anyone has any additional questions, uh, Dick is gonna stick around. Uh, we're just about towards 1 p.m. And so Becky, go ahead. Sure. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today for our engineering spotlight on Chicago's water system and a huge thank you to Dick Lanyon. We look forward to presenting future discussions to spotlight more important topics in engineering. A recording from today's presentation will be available soon and you will receive a link to the video in, via email. Many thanks to today's sponsors, Christopher B. Christopher B. Burke Engineering, Stephen Schlegel, Sharon Harmsworth, Diane Ferrari and Solace O'Brien. Thank you to the Illinois section of ASCE for providing PDH certificates for our participants. If you would like to request a PDH certificate, please complete the online form available via the link in the chat. More information about Chicago Engineers Foundation is available at our website, chicagoengineersfoundation.org and via our social media pages. 